Welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Thomas and I'm one of the managing members at Elevate Oral Care. Thank you for joining us tonight. Before we start, let me cover a few housekeeping notes. For those of you remaining online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within a couple of hours of completion of this talk. Be sure to check your spam folder. You are muted, so don't worry about background noise. We, have, we will have time at the end for questions. Submit your questions on your webinar dashboard. My colleague, Steve Pardue, will track questions throughout the talk. Throughout 2020, we held a series of free live CE webinars on topics aimed at preparing offices for the expected changes to patient care. Each of these webinars were recorded and are available with free self-instruction CE at the web address you see on the screen, elevateoralcare.com backslash elevating care. Bookmark this page and return often to see what's new. We are putting together our 2021 free live CE calendar. Feel free to suggest topics at info at elevateoralcare.com. So if you have a suggestion, info at elevateoralcare.com. We are honored tonight to host Dr. Kevin Donnelly, who will provide an overview of evidence-based prevention options for in-office and at-home therapies for patients with moderate to high risk for caries. A recent ADA Health Policy Institute survey found that over 25% of offices are observing an increase in the incidence of caries in their patient base since the start of the pandemic. Dr. Donnelly's subject tonight was important prior to March and is even more critical today. Kevin Donnelly, DDS MS, is professor and chair in the Department of Developmental Dentistry and professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. He received his DDS in 1984, certificate in pediatric dentistry in 1986, and MS in 1986 from the University of Iowa. Dr. Donnelly has an extensive list of achievements and offices held within organized dentistry, including being the immediate past president of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. He has published over 350 chapters, manuscripts and abstracts associated with pediatric dentistry, prevention, dental restorative materials research, and clinical utilization. Finally, and most importantly, I've known Dr. Donnelly for about 20 years. His biggest asset by far is his big and caring heart. Dr. Donnelly, take it away. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I know you're just dying to sit around your computer tonight for an hour, but thanks for joining us. Um, I have to at first disclose, uh, since I don't have much time, I'm gonna try to move this along. Basically, uh, I've done research for a whole lot of companies. Uh, however, I've done, most of my research has been for the National Institute of Health, and I've received a significant money at HRSA. As you know, both of those are federal, and so at least 75 of my dollars come from there. So uh, I am not a paid consultant to any industry whatsoever, but I've done research for them, and that's where the money comes from. So I hope you think I'm somewhat not biased uh, because of that. <clears throat> Uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, prevention and remineralizing agents because, boy, we're trying to uh, relieve the amount of aerosols that we create nowadays. And uh, certainly when we're only providing emergency care and move to elective care, we kind of got into this modem of more heavy prevention than ever, I think. And I wanted to kind of hit base on that. And I had the honor of running uh, the original uh, consensus conference for the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. And the first consensus conference uh, was on pediatric restorative dentistry. And then I was invited to come back as the chair of the update on that. And we did that in 2015 uh, down your way, Kevin, in Florida. And one of the things we did, and I just want to concentrate on number four here, is one of the things we better defined was that dental caries management includes individualized prevention, therapeutic interventions, ongoing surveillance, and necessary restorative therapy. And you know, we had a risk assessment uh, paper on the original one that was in 2002, but people still thought we were leaning to cutting as fast as we could. And we wanted to clarify that we truly believe 
you cut when you have cavitation. Up until that time, it's prevention and remineralization. Unless maybe you're in the OR or something, you know, extenuating. But on an outpatient basis, that's what we believe in. And as long as you can maintain that surface zone there um, above the you can easily remin that. And uh, to an extent, uh, Merck's Fairhurst told us that you can even remineralize not only enamel, but early dentin lesions too. So certainly I think we're on the path of prevention and remin right now. And this was before COVID-19 hit. And now that COVID-19 is here, I think we're even more attuned to, to our prevention and remin. So what's the first thing we do about remin? Well, heck, we brush with fluoridated toothpaste. And I guess if Kathy flights from here, she'd say, well, if everybody do that, you wouldn't have to lecture anymore, Kevin, and people wouldn't have to listen to you. And isn't that the truth? Uh, people aren't too compliant all the time. So what has happened with fluoride dentifrice? When I was a student, about half the schools in this country said start at age two, because if you use it before age two, they swallow too much of it. And the other half of the country said, hey, start right when the first tooth erupts. And what the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry promoted was, it's up to you guys, your doctors. It all depends on risk assessment. And if that kid's at low risk, they probably don't need fluoridated toothpaste right away. If they're at higher risk, they do. And it wasn't until 2014 that the American Dental Association finally came back and said, you know what? We recommend that every child have their teeth brushed as soon as the first tooth erupts. And this was something really major for the American Dental Association to recommend. And the reason they did, it was the first time in history we had ever seen an increase in uh, dental caries. And who was it in? The two to five-year-olds. So certainly I think uh, tooth brushing is a big way where we're at. But Steve Adair from Georgia at that time had said, you know what guys, kids, uh, suck down about 50% of the toothpaste because they like the taste. So we became in a big way promoters of the pea size for toddlers. And then for infants, uh, right when you brush it when that first tooth erupts, kind of a smear layer or a rice uh, amount, uh, you know, a very minimal amount so that if the kids do swallow it, it's not that big of a deal. And we have been very effective at it. The CDC says we were so effective at uh, teaching this to our parents in the country, um, it was uh, only um, surpassed really by when we decided to move children from uh, their back to their stomach and back and forth on that. So anyway, so what do we do um, if we need more than just toothpaste? Well, usually toothpaste is enough for low risk kids. Uh, you know, we recommend they brush twice a day with a fluoride toothpaste. But what do you do for those moderate and high risk kids? Well, if they're older than six, they can go on to the rinses. They can do the weekly rinses, you know, with the 2% sodium fluorides. They can do the daily rinses with the 0.05% sodium fluoride rinses. Or they can uh, go on to higher dose denifrices or gels. And so we'll talk about that for a minute. And, you know, when this was all being evaluated, there was an interest in what's really available in pharmacies? You know, you guys prescribe these higher dose fluorides when just benefits isn't doing it. What's going on out there? This just got uh, published in Compendium and uh, a resident that uh, is at my school now, uh, Dr. J, uh, worked with uh, us on this and we looked at the price and availability of pres prescription fluoride toothpaste in U.S. pharmacies. And I think this is a big interest. And this survey included 192 pharmacies uh, surveyed from 47 states in the United States. There was a mix of rural, suburban, and urban sites during this. And there were 360 toothpaste products uh, available uh, uh, that could be evaluated from these 192 pharmacies. And the average amount in a pharmacy was about two options. And you know, I think you think when you write a script for somebody, they can go into that pharmacy and there's a huge choice. And oh guys, there is not. Uh, this this lecture is going to be uh, available online, as uh, Kevin said. And so you can uh, actually link into these papers if you ever want to. Uh, but what our key findings with, of this was there was a riot, wide cost variation. And I guess you might guess California was more expensive than Texas and et cetera. 
but also, and this is really critical, guys, 54% of the pharmacies either stopped, no options. I mean, you got one, right? They had none or one. And that's over half, guys. And so that really doesn't leave much to uh, the pharmacist to give to the patient or the patient to choose from. And of those uh, stockings that had only uh, a single one, 80% uh, were the 1.8 ounce to two ounce sizes. You know, those little ones, guys. And so those really are designed to last a month. And so do you really expect your patient uh, to be compliant, to go back to the pharmacy, you know, for refills if you only see them every six months and get that done? Um, and so I think we want to, uh, as a, from a dental standpoint, make it available for convenience for folks so they can get it easier. And the cost really was between uh, 48 and 63 dollars for these uh, these products. So I guess what I came out of this study thinking was, you know, we all are busy, and I know we're busy, but maybe it's better uh, to have in-office dispensing. And I know that probably freaks some of you out, but then you know what you're giving them, and you know they're compliant because you're handing it to them and saying, use this toothpaste. Um, you can give them instruction. It might be your hygienist. It might be your dental assistant. Uh, the average cost, if you do it this way, and I'll get into that a little later, is cheaper. So you're saving money for your patient anyway, and it's just convenient for the patient. Um, there's, there's things in the literature that say that, papers in the literature that say, if it is not a life-threatening medication, about 50% of prescriptions are filled. Is that not terrifying? And I hate to think that people might not think dental caries is a life-threatening thing. And so we can guess that at least 50% of the prescriptions we write probably aren't filled. So, you know, there's other issues that come into place, like state and local regulations. Can you dispense stuff through your office? Um, do you have space for it? And things like that. Just like pharmacies might not have many products uh, available for choice because they don't have the space. And do dental schools really teach this in their curriculum? And I can assure you, we do not. So I think you could think about dispensing through the office and then get better compliance. But something that's gonna become available, now remember, you can look this up online later if you want this information, um, is the National Online Pharmacy. I personally uh, take, uh, I have high cholesterol, so I take cholesterol medicine. And I work through a company called Express Script. And this healthwarehouse.com is kind of similar to that. I get my stuff mailed to me. I get them in three month doses. So I don't have to go to the pharmacy every month. And then if I, um, at the end of my prescription, uh, they just call my physician and my physician sends it back in. They send them, you know, the script and my physician signs it and just asks me to come once a year for my physical. So this is kind of similar to that. You would have a fax form and you can select uh, from there what brand you want and decide from that. Then what makes it nice, you're done. Then the patient is contacted directly from the company, from Health Warehouse. And they do the set up the billing and everything like that. So it's probably just like my express scripts. Uh, you can get a six month supply easily. Uh, like I said, under $40. So it's more convenient to your uh, patients, it's more convenient to you. And I want you to understand that this is gonna become available uh, within the next month or two. So keep your eyeballs peeled for, for that. So anybody that knows me knows, mention and remin come on the home base is fluoride. And fluoride really works in three ways. Uh, it inhibits demand, it enhances remineralization by uh, more rapidly carrying uh, calcium phosphate into subsurface lesions. And even at small doses, it affects the bacterial metabolism. It inhibits that. And so all these three ways have helped us uh, as we provide uh, topical fluorides. So then you look at the topical fluorides that are out there and really uh, it's 1.23% uh, acidulated phosphate fluoride, 8% stannous fluoride, 2% sodium fluoride, 5% uh, fluoride varnish, and really they come in others we'll talk about and 38% silver diamond fluoride. So I'm gonna hit on these briefly. As anti-caries agents, the big three 
are sodium fluoride, stannous fluoride, and acidulated phosphate. And what the recent data shows us is they inhibit uh, the amount of caries, the prevalence of caries, by about a third, so about 33%. Now, if you're an old man like me, uh, you know that back in the 50s and the 60s, we were seeing a 65% decrease in caries. So you're talking twice that. And why? Why is it so much less now? Well, I think the reason it's less is, remember, fluoridated toothpaste wasn't introduced to the marketplace until 1972. So some people think because it's 33% instead of 66% reduction, that is half as good. Well, that's not true. And insurance companies know that, even though some of them are using this data to say, hey, let's just uh, pay for a professionally applied topical fluoride once a year. We still know that twice a year, even with a third reduction, is twice as good as once a year. And trust me, the insurance companies know this. This is a money game. So I think we have to fight uh, to keep uh, professionally applied topical fluoride in the game plan. So we've got fluoride varnish. There's a number of fluoride varnishes out there by far. Um, uh, the 5% and 2.5% are used much more than 0.7%, which comes out of Ivoclar. And why do we like these so much? Well, because they're so safe. Well, why aren't they then accepted by the FDA and the ADA as a uh, anti-caries agents. You know, there's data all over the place showing that. Well, I happen to be on the expert panel that reviewed every paper that was ever published on, uh, on fluoride varnishes, and I can assure you it is as good or better than APA for sure. But why doesn't our FDA and ADA let us say that? And the reason is it doesn't meet their requirements of having a minimum of three clinical trials two of which must have been done within the United States border. The third can be inside the U.S. or outside the U.S., but it must be under an IRB approval from the U.S., from a U.S. institution. And so, come on, that's ridiculous. So it was accepted as a root desensitizing agent, and I know I'm desensitizing a whole lot of roots on kids, and I bet you are too. Uh, come on, we're using this as an anti-caries uh, agent. And so one of the things I think the ADA did that was so good for you as practicing dentists is they put an expert panel together. We reviewed the literature. We said it is as good as or better. It's published as recommendations through the American Dental Association. Therefore, it is accepted as the dental standard of the care by your profession. And you can use a 50,000 part per million dentifrice, I mean, uh, fluoride varnish, and still be considered following the standard of the care of your profession. So these are good things. So what are you supposed to do? Of course, remove the gross plaque, paint it on the teeth, tell people not to brush for 24 to 48 hours. What we do is we just tell them, don't brush the rest of the day. And I have yet to find a study that says that two hours is uh, any different than 24 hours. And I think the reason we say 24 hours is that's what everybody else is saying, so we just want to fit in. But there's not really a lot of data out there, but we wanted to try to sit on the two surfaces as long as possible so that fluoride ion that's available will be taken up into those hydroxyl uh, imperfections in the surface of the enamel and uh, provide you fluoridated hydroxyapatite, which demands much, much slower than natural enamel. So you paint it on there uh, and you're happy. Your patients might be happy, they might not. Well, for us, you can use it on anybody and it's been shown to be effective on any age. However, uh, we typically gear it towards under age six. And the reason is age six uh, and above really have the coordination to be able to use uh, professionally applied topical fluoride in their mouth, use suction at the same time to prevent any potential uh, swelling of the fluoride and things like that. And so we use the varnishes on the really little kids, and we usually use the APS on the older kids, although we know darn well so uh, sodium fluoride varnish is good on any age. So that brings us to our next one, which is silver diamine fluoride. And, you know, this was accepted, uh, well, really cleared by the uh, 
FDA in 2014, but again, it was ex, um, really cleared as a desensitizing agent, root desensitizer. Well, just like a sodium fluoride varnish, uh, we knew in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all over the place, these were very effective as a caries arrest um, product. You know, it could really arrest caries, stop it right in its tracks. So why couldn't we claim that in the United States? Well, it goes back to the same reason sodium fluoride varnish couldn't be because we didn't have three clinical trials from within the U.S. borders at that time. And so you ask, well, if you've known for years uh, why this was so effective, why didn't it come to the U.S. earlier? And I think it's our fault, this dentistry's fault. And, you know, we're looking at post-World War II, and the countries were, that we're using the most were Asian countries at that time, Vietnam in a big way, and had very positive results. And the concept, sometimes they use probably more silver nitrate during the 40s and the 50s, but it was the same concept because silver ion was taken up within that dentin. And We'll get into how SDF works. You had the advantage of not just the silver ion with SDF, but you've also got the fluoron um, ion available. Right now, we use a specific code, uh, D1354, and that stands for carries arrest, and we're gonna get into what's gonna happen in January in a second here. So right now in the United States, we have uh, two SDFs that are available. They're both 38%. Uh, Advantage of Rest was the first one on the market. And more recently, Reva Star has been introduced to the marketplace. They're both 38% uh, silver uh, diamine fluoride. Um, Advantage of Rest has a nice tint blue. So you can see it easier when you put it on or you can get white, clear. Um, and what's the product have? Well, it's 25% uh, by weight silver, 5% by weight fluoride, and the pH of Advantage of Rest is 10, and the pH of Reva Star is 13. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute too. So what are the advantages of using Advantage of Rest? Well, I guess you can use it on root sensitivity, and I know there's some work coming out of several institutions right now looking at it for nursing home patients and root caries. And thank God we work with children now. And we don't worry as much about root caries, but certainly we're using it as an caries arrest, uh, which has been shown in Asia, as I said, Australia, New Zealand for years. It's easy to apply. Uh, I don't know if we just get all the young kids that have caries at age two and they really don't sit there real well for treatment. Uh, so, boy, is it nice having this available, particularly when we can't run right into the operating room anymore. So sometimes we're using it to just buy us time. So this is a comparison of the products. I, I'm under limited time, so I'm gonna kind of rush through this, but again, you can go find this online if, if you wanna look at it. But the key point I wanna look at here is the pH, which I brought up a little earlier. Advantage rest is a pH of 10. So obviously you're trying to keep it on the teeth, um, but invariably uh, you're gonna get it on the gingiva. Well, at 13, I want you to remember how basic that is. And, you know, I go back to why the heck do we use calcium hydroxide for direct pulp caps and for filling Avol's teeth when we put them back in? Well, it's because calcium hydroxide is so basic, kills any bacteria that are there. So it maintains the vitality of the PDL, but in a direct pulp cap or an indirect, um, it will actually kill any bacteria that are right there, right? That's really strong stuff, and that's within a tooth. If you get that on the gingiva, you can get some pretty severe burns. So you really need to keep that in mind if you're using a 13% pH. How does it work? Well, this is a real wordy slide, so I'm gonna take you to the bottom bullet point. And what happens really is the silver ion penetrates about 25 microns into enamel but it penetrates up to 200 microns in dentin, and that's pretty impressive. And so I guess you all, well, maybe you don't, some of you young folks might not, but I can remember cutting out old amalgam restorations. And remember how it was pitch black when you got the amalgam out? 
And you weren't replacing it because of secondary carriers, you were replacing it because the amalgam restoration broke or the tooth broke. And so you'd cut it out and you wouldn't have to put a base. I mean, it was just hard as a rock on that. And that's because that silver ion was taken up into that tooth structure, into that dent. Well, the same thing's true when you're applying it to these kids, it's up taken into dentin really well. So it's indicated for obviously extensive caries, including early childhood caries. Um, treatment where behavior might be a challenge and boy, does that not go hand in hand with early childhood caries, but it could also be special patients, you know? But uh, we use it a lot for kids that have early childhood caries and we can't get them to operate. Um, patients that have carious lesions that can't be treated all at once. I mean, if you have a three month waiting list or what about when we could only provide emergency care? We were putting silver diamine fluoride all over the place, knowing it's going to be months until we can come in and start restoring, and we don't want everything to break down any worse than possible. So then the question comes about, and I'll have to show you a study later, is application of one or two times, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so this is the study I'm talking about. 212 children aged three to four, they had to have dental caries. They were randomized into three groups. One of their groups had SDF applied once in one year. The next one had two applications of SDF applied in one year. It happened to be biannual. And the third group had one application of glass ionomer cement. And basically what they found was there was no difference between the glass ionomer cement and the one application of silver diamine fluoride. However, there was 2.98 times the benefit if you had two applications of silver diamine fluoride. I can tell you, I have searched the literature inside and out. And although this says biannual, there is no literature that says that once every month is worse than once every six months. And so for our kids, we're trying to tie it over to the OR. We might see them at one month, two months, three months to reapply to get that second coat on and get that, that benefit of three times the benefit you can have by doing that, just to tide these kids over until we can get them in the operating room. And I gotta tell you, some of the times, uh, if they don't show up for a while, uh, you find that that's almost definitive treatment. We don't recommend it as definitive treatment. We're doing it as an adjunct to what we already have, but boy, I'm telling you, this really arrests carries. If you haven't used it, you need to. If you have, you already know what I'm talking about. So again, you, you know, remove the debris from the teeth, you dry them as well as possible. Apply uh, silver diamine fluoride for one minute. That's the typical recommendation. I know there's a video out of uh, UCSF that says two minutes, and I could stand on my head and not be able to last for two minutes uh, putting this on. And, you know, do I really apply it for one minute? Um, let's just say yes, uh, knowing that uh, what I try to tell everybody is you do the best you can do in a bad situation. It might be 20 seconds, but we give it our best effort. So this is a slide that was given to me by Dr. Hirsch over Florida Way. And you can see the carries on that primary first smaller. He put silver diamine fluoride and then put the glass armor on top. You can do that, but you know, then you don't have the advantage of the second application of silver diamine fluoride. And I guess where I look at this is if I can really keep the kid in good enough uh, behavior to be able to put a restoration in there, I'll probably do a definitive restoration. If I can't and they're all over the wall and I'm all, all over the place, well, they're just going to get silver diamond fluoride and they're probably coming back in the next two months and getting another application. The reason I put this slide in is because I wanted to remind myself this is quite effective in enamel and we'll hit on that too. So the big question is, do I need to get that darn spoon out and take out the mass of carries and uh, take it down to where it's like an indirect pulp cap uh, before I apply my silver diamine fluoride? No. Research shows us you do not have to take any carries out. You can apply your silver diamine fluoride, it will penetrate and it will arrest uh, the carries and make that dent in the heart. Um, another study showed uh, that 38% SDF was significantly better than 5% sodium fluoride varnish when it's applied every three months 
to arrest carriers, not necessarily to prevent carriers. So what's a bad down? I mean, are there downsides? Well, yeah, it goes back to the 40s on my point of why didn't we bring them to the US earlier when we knew it was quite effective in Asia? Well, we were the richest country in the world and we didn't want kids to have black teeth, particularly front teeth. Well, with immigration and now with COVID, uh, we're in a whole different world, guys. And so we need this. And so thank goodness we have it okayed in this country to use now. Uh, the downside, in my mind, the biggest one is it turns teeth black. It still has, you know, a metallic taste. It really can uh, um, irritate the ginger, as we've already mentioned, particularly with a high pH. So be careful there. Consider a rubber dam if you're going to use a pH of 13. Um, but, you know, when I tell you that there's going to turn the teeth black, I think when you tell parents that, you really need to stress that. And I think everybody kind of has their own vision of what that means. And um, I think you should show them a picture of a tooth that you've done and it's pitch black and they know exactly what you mean when you say it. And I think you should get consent separately for the application of this, just like we do now for a bamboo sport or anything else. I think you should get separate consent for uh, placement of silver diamine fluoride. Is it safe? Oh, heck, it's... It's just like a sodium fluoride varnish, 400 fold the margin of safety. This is safe guys, and it's a good thing. So as I said, I'd mentioned what's happening in January of 2021. Um, we will get a new code, the CDT code of D1355. This is now not using uh, SDF as a carries arrest product, this is now using as a preventive medicament, and you'll charge uh, application per tooth. And I think this is going to come in hand really cool for geriatric dentistry, uh, particularly kid, people in nursing homes or people that are ambulatory anyway. And I think it's going to become a big deal with us in pediatric dentistry. I think we will start to use it just as much for prevention as we will for caries of rest. And this slide uh, is a polarized light photomicrograph uh, that was taken uh, by uh, Jenny Ahn. She's a pediatric dentist out San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but the original uh, lesion on this was uh, made by Dr. Oliver, who's here in San Antonio. But the reason I wanted to show you this is to remind myself about enamel again, like I showed you the clinical picture of painting it on uh, smooth surfaces. When you paint silver diamine fluoride on these, I'm telling you, if it's slightly demand, even the surface zone, which is one to 4% pore volume, it fills that with silver diamine fluoride. And we took these specimens back and we tried to demin them again. Oh, you can't demin them. And so when I'm looking at, uh, I'm doing a crown or a class two on the distal of a primary second, let's say, and I see a white spot lesion on the mesial of a permanent first molar, or you know, it could be on a primary molar, on the proximal surface, but posterior where you're not going to see it. There is no question if this was my kid, I would do silver diamine fluoride. And, you know, I've gone through the phases where I put fluoride on, or I've tried to put a sealant on. I'm telling you, this is as hard as a rock. It's going to keep that tooth effective, and nobody's going to see the black part on the mesial of a permanent first molar. So I think that I've added that to my armamentarium, and I'm using it uh, more frequently than you might think. So that now takes us to the fluoride gels we used to have uh, here in Texas. Uh, anybody here gel cam? Uh, it's a standard fluoride gel, um, 1,000 parts per million fluoride. It was invented by Iris Shannon. It was at the VA, and the reason... You know, people loved it. It was really for those darn perio bugs because you'd paint it on the teeth, but it'd flow sub G. So it helped, you know, remand or inhibit demand of teeth, but it also affect the bacteria. If I'm doing kids, it's coronal carriers I'm worried about. And I would use probably, um, if I'm using a gel, I would use care gel. If I'm using a dentifrice, there's a number of dentifrices out there. And I think you, Pick and choose what you like best. Look at all the data out there and make your choice on what you think is best. But I certainly would recommend sodium fluoride at this time. 
Well, that takes us to xylitol. Oh, is this all over the place? Uh, you can choose xylitol gum if it's at a minimum of six grams a day, and it can inhibit uh, caries. Well, that's a little gray area there. Uh, we know it can affect the pH, and if you use xylitol at seven grams a day, I don't care if it's in gum, if it's in toothpaste, but if you use it for a minimum of four uh, weeks, 60 weeks is shown for sure to be effective, but I've seen it uh, many times at four weeks, it buffers the pH of the bacteria. So this can be a good thing. The reason we don't really know is because there's not a lot of outcome data on caries. It's all on pH and we extrapolate that, that well, if it affects the pH, then it'll probably slow down caries. And it may. And so if you're using xylitol for that reason, it may. I'm just telling you, there's not much data out there that shows it inhibits caries. Um, and certainly with what's available over the counter in gums, I think the biggest one last I checked was Orbit, which is made by Wrigley's. Um, can have some effect, it's recommended for that, but come on guys, that is so much lower than seven grams a day. And so there's no sound literature that says it inhibits caries. Oh, I'm sorry. And then where we really have seen so far uh, xylitol to be the most effective on sound data of caries inhibition was this soldering study that was published in 2000 and it showed us, hey guys, um, if you give the last trimester xylitol to the mom, the kids will be have less caries at age three. Well, that's 169 moms compared with 169 kids. And that's the only data on that. They carried that study out to age six and no significant difference anymore. Well, does that mean it's no good? Well, we don't know because at age three, you're taking the kid to the operating room, right? At age six, you're treating them on an outpatient basis. So I'm not discouraging the use of xylitol with pregnant mothers. I'm just saying 169 mothers and infants. It's not a whole lot of data, guys. So we have the effectiveness of xylitol in school-based programs, 562 uh, kids from five to six years of age. Uh, Dr. Ferretti and Dr. Milgram did this up in Cleveland. And they randomized kids by their classroom. So everybody in the same classroom did the same thing, made it simple. And so the kids either uh, brushed their, uh, got a prophylaxis with a fluoridated uh, sodium fluoride uh, varnish and they were told to brush their teeth uh, with fluoridated toothpaste. Uh, another group uh, just had uh, fluoridated toothpaste and another one uh, was the control. So what did we really see from all of that? And by the way, the kids got sealants as they went through this. This was a two and a half year study at 30 months, two and a half years, they went back and I looked at uh, decayed missing field surfaces on primary surfaces. That's why those are little d, MFS. And what they found was that the xylitol really had no additional benefit. Now, I want you to understand this xylitol uh, was obtained five days a week, nine months a year. So, you know, then you add it all into these fluoridated oral hygiene instructions with toothbrush prophylaxis with fluoridated dentist and fluoride uh, varnish, it really didn't have any effects. So where does that lead me to think? Well, if kids have normal salivary flow, I, I, I don't think it's probably the answer at this time, but we just need more data. So the uh, American Dental Association put a expert panel together. I was on that panel uh, to evaluate uh, the effects of prevention with non-fluoride remineralization and caries inhibition products. Uh, the chair of this uh, specialized group was uh, Tim Wright out of North Carolina. And what we came out of this, we, I mean, we exhaustively looked at the literature. And what we said is in children aged 5 to 16 years, supervised consumption of chewing gum sweetened with sucrose-free polyol, it could be with xylitol only, or it could be combinations. Um, Basically, they were sucrose free. And if it was chewed for 10 to 20 minutes after meals, it marginally reduced the incidence of caries. 
and probably some of you guys that are my age, uh, I don't think anybody older, uh, remembers those full page ads run by Wrigley. And that was their sugar gum. Remember Dolomite and Spearmint and Juicy Fruit, those? Well, they showed that if you chewed gum after meals, if you couldn't brush your teeth, it had a positive effect. And that's what we're saying about these over the counter, um, you know, gums is basically, we're not sure if it's a xylitol or if it's just the stimulation of salivary flow. But we know it's mildly effective. In children reporting carries experience, consumption of xylitol containing lozenges or hard candy reduces the incidence of caries. You can get lozenges out there that have xylitol in it. And this study that uh, we looked at had 30 participants, 15 in the control group that got nothing, 15 in the experimental group. Well, it was very, it was significantly uh, better if you had the xylitol lozenge, but that's in 15 kids versus 15 kids. So we said it was a low level of certainty just because that's just not too many kids, guys. So that now takes us to the big answer, amorphous calcium phosphate. You know, it was marketed as recaldent. It came out by Dr. Reynolds in Australia first. It was in a gum. Uh, and then uh, the patent was uh, paid to be used by GC and they put it in MI paste and later came MI paste plus. Well, the active ingredient in this is the amorphous calcium phosphate. And I talked to our residents a lot about this. If your saliva is super saturated in calcium phosphate, can you super, super saturate it? No, what happens? Everything mineralizes, right? It chelates and drops to the floor of the mouth. And in fact, that is what happens with MI paste. So then they came out with MI paste plus MI Paste Plus has all that great calcium that's in MI Paste, but they added 900 parts per million fluoride. Think that's better? About almost what a dentifrice is, right? 1,000 parts per million dentifrice? No, 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 because you have all that extra calcium there. So what happens when calcium gets that close to fluoride? It binds it. And so, in fact, uh, we had a student um, that won this uh, who now practices in Colorado Springs. Um, and Derek did a good job and won the Academy's Research Award for this, showing that really it was ineffective if you have normal salivary flow. Can it be effective if you don't? Well, sure it could. And I've heard people say, you know, they rub it on people's teeth that are in ortho brackets. Well, that's because salivary flow is not necessarily getting to there. So, I mean, I think that's understandable, but obviously I think that a lot of people want you to use on every single person. And if you are going to use it, I think you have to use it on those high risk people. And I've had people tell me, you know, I put it in trays for head and neck radiation uh, patients that are adults. Okay, I have no problem with that, great. And they go, do you do that? And I go, no, I wouldn't do that. Because I got fluoride, I already know fluoride works, right? And so I haven't replaced fluoride with it. So here's some trials. I love this trial that was done in Thailand. It was done in a preschool there. It was a one-year double-blind placebo-controlled study. Uh, about half the kids uh, that were two and a half to three years old received uh, five days a week, um, basically in my paste. Over there, it's called um, tooth mousse. But it's the same thing. It's the same product. So they painted on the kids' teeth uh, five days a week for nine months. Kids weren't at the daycare in the summer. So they did that over a whole year and they used the IC DOS system. And I think you all know that's just white spots because you really wouldn't expect cavitation in a one year, but you expect white spots. And they use that as the analysis. And what they found is kids that got it five days a week, there was no significant difference between those and the ones that did not get it. So that kind of leans me away from this. And then there was another study done that was double blind randomized crossover in situ study. And it had 13 participants that went through three, four week legs. They had a washout period in between. And so the, the legs that were there was the application of uh, the tooth mousse or MI paste uh, after use of fluoride dentifrice twice a day. So they're doing the normal twice a day thing, right? And you added uh, the MI paste into it. Uh, the second group had fluoride dentifrice twice a day only. 
And the third group uh, had non-fluoridated uh, toothpaste twice a day. I got to tell you, that is so hard to get to IRB because I've done it and oh, it's tough. And that's why we have washout periods. But anyway, what they found was that um, the twice a day fluoridated toothpaste, whether you had MI paste with it or not, they weren't significantly different, but they were both better than no fluoride at all. Well, hit me in the head. Uh, I guess I probably would have guessed that. Uh, but there was no difference between adding MI paste into it. So I think that's pretty it. And then my last slides I'm going to end with, and I kind of put this into the prevention thing because um, it's being recommended that you can put ICON on, the resin infiltrate onto white spot lesions. You can do it on anterior teeth and uh, published in JADA, it's beautiful. Uh, holds this color we know for at least two years. Um, so facial surfaces, maybe post-ortho treatment things, uh, there's been data supporting that. Uh, but it also comes with the tip you see here, and that's a piece of cellophane. And trust me, the cellophane doesn't go between tight contacts. You need to put separators in and bring the kid back to get that cellophane through there. And then you etch the proximal surface with hydrochloric acid, just like you do facial surfaces. And then um, you flow your resin infiltrate, and it's supposed to be going right into that subsurface lesion. I've seen beautiful SCMs of it. You know, uh, this is made uh, in conjunction of uh, DMG with the University of Berlin. And so it was presented to me uh, many years ago when I was in Munich, and they said, what do you think? And the first question I said is, is it radiopaque? And they said, no. I said, oh, that's gonna be a problem. And they said, no, because we give them a card that says, you know, they used it and they take the card with them so they can tell a dentist if they change the dentist that they really have had icon. Okay, so here's the first study. I always ask, what clinical trials do you have? At that time, they had none. So they only had in vitro lab-based stuff. So this is the first one they gave to. 42 children, split mouth design. They either had... Um, you know, an icon put into a lesion, a proximal lesion, or nothing. So you were, uh, I mean, or a varnish, or a fluoride varnish. So you compared those two. Split mouth, so the same kid on one side, remember, got fluoride varnish. On the other side, they got the resin infiltrate. And when you look at this last line here, 23% of the infiltrate progressed over one year, whereas 62% of the fluoride varnishes did. And you say to yourself, that is so much better. Well, it is, but think about it. If you just perfectly sealed off a proximal lesion and it integrated into the subsurface lesion, would you expect 23% of those to advance? And so I wasn't excited. How's that? So this is the next paper that came out a couple years later. Uh, 22 adults that had proximal lesions uh, at least halfway into enamel, but it could have been a third of the way in the dent. And they had 29 lesions in 22 adults. They either had icon or nothing. So the control had nothing, the other side had icon. And after three years, 4% of the infiltrate progressed. Now that's way better than 23%, isn't it? So I'm getting excited. Uh, whereas 42%, almost half of the other lesions progressed that were the control that had no treatment. So I am starting to get a little excited, but within 30 days, this paper comes out in the Journal of Dental Research. Another three-year trial, uh, 39 adults, same kind of study environment as the last one. On the three lesions each patient had, one got ICON, one received a sealant, and one was a control. Well, both the ICON and the sealant broke out, they were better than the control, they got nothing, but there was no significant difference between the sealant and the icon. Now remember, you gotta separate the teeth, etch with phosphoric acid, throw a sealant on, and what's supposed to make the icon so much better is you're etching with a much stronger acid, hydrochloric acid, and it's really penetrating into there, and that's what's inhibiting caries, yet you see no significant difference. So where am I at? I'm nowhere. I uh, wanna see more data. I think it's okay to do it. I think you need to be following those kids in your practice. Uh, I'm worried about kids that are really mobile, like high-risk kids, because are they really going to take this information and tell someone else they had ICON put on it? But certainly, I know Rick Shade in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, did hundreds of them and had great success. This was in a population that was in his practice and stayed in his practice and could follow. 
So I think there are potential bonuses, but I think you need to be cautious. So anyway, I made it on time. Uh, thanks for hanging in there, people. And um, I guess I'll be opening the floor up for questions soon. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Donnelly. That was a very informative and uh, excellent presentation. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Please keep in mind that uh, your CE certificate will be emailed to you within the next few hours after this presentation is over. We do have a few questions that came in. I'd like to go ahead and ask some of those right now. So uh, Dr. Donnelly, the first question um, is in re is regards to the silver diamine fluoride and how you charge for it. So when you're scheduling multiple applications of silver diamine fluoride for a child to get them through to the OR, are you charging per application or you're charging a flat fee in order to do that? How do you handle those? We are charging per tooth. Um, you know, unfortunately for us, uh, we're in between with our Texas Medicaid system and then a lot of the kids we see are the Texas Medicaid system. Um, uh, if it's a private patient, we have them pay and it's a per two thing. It's not per whole application because we don't always put it everywhere. Like fluoride varnish we do, but usually we go site specific uh, because we're trying to arrest caries, right? Um, now that it's gonna be uh, put out there in January as a preventive agent, again, they recommend that you can go uh, per tooth charge. So I imagine we will do the same thing at that time. Okay. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. The next question is in regards to SDF use as well as the Icon Infiltrant product. Is there any contraindication to applying SDF to a lesion and then later attempting resin infiltration? You know, that's a great question. And what I think, and this is my preliminary data, is I think you don't need to put infiltrate if you already put silver diamine fluoride on there unless you're trying to somehow cover it up you know aesthetically or something i think that in enamel i think you're going to have a very hard time etching enamel i have seen several studies that uh it does not affect uh your ability to etch dentin but um i gotta tell you in enamel i mean this stuff is rock hard and so i mean you know all our residents tell us there's no more research to do out there well I think there is, and uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it because I don't think you can etch it well, but um, I can't say that for a fact until we do it in the lab and find out. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is in regards to silver diamine fluoride and fluoride varnish. Do you have an opinion on silver diamine fluoride application followed by fluoride varnish application to cover up that silver diamine fluoride and perhaps get it to soak longer in an uncooperative child? I had a slide on that and I took it out because I didn't think I'd make my 50 minutes. Um, there is no evidence that putting a fluoride varnish over uh, SDF um, it has any additional benefit. Okay, very okay. good. Um, the next question is in a, a different topic. Do you prefer sodium fluoride prescription toothpaste versus stannous fluoride gel for high caries risk patients? And um, uh, what play, or how do you decide which patients receive which type of product? Um, well, to make it simple, because I'm a pretty simplistic person, uh, I don't use any stannous fluoride on kids. Um, and the reason I don't um, is because I like the molecular breakdown of sodium fluoride. It breaks out fast, as you know um just by his formulation and depending on what company you're dealing with you know i live in texas and remember i teach all students for graduate level and undergraduate levels and gel cam is so pushed here that it's almost synonymous with stannous fluoride um you know in the gel form and remember it's a thousand parts per million stannous fluoride whereas um you know a denifrous fluor sodium fluoride 1.1 percent uh denifrous is at 5,000 parts per million fluoride and so i choose to go with it because most of them that we use here in texas are at a higher fluoride level and that's exactly why i'm putting the kit on it is i want a higher fluoride level Does that make sense absolutely appreciate the answer yes thank you very much 
Uh, the next question, uh, back to silver diamine fluoride. What are your thoughts on using a curing light on silver diamine fluoride once applied? Um, they've, this individual hasn't done it themselves, but they've heard of other clinicians that do it, and they were questioning which is the appropriate process. Well, it's not recommended to do, um, but you know what? I've had friends that said, I do it, and they go, you know, Kevin, the reason I do it is I think the heat from the light drives it faster. And I mean, if you're like me, you know, you're probably not getting your full minute application. And I think what they think is it might dry the surface faster so that you have more uptake. And I, what I try to do is as much as I possibly can keep rubbing it on so that at the surface you still have the uptake. Um, so I don't think it hurts anything. I don't know if it helps anything. Um, and it might help if you really don't have much time, much contact time with it. But if that's true, then you get a light in there either. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I'm not aware of any data that proves it correctly, that it's a benefit, but anecdotally it might be if it dries it. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Next question is also on silver diamine fluoride. What do you think of using silver diamine fluoride as a sealant, as in applying it in routine exams or potentially annually, uh, in place of a sealant for a preventive application? Well, I think this is somewhere where we're headed. And uh, uh, a resident I had that just graduated uh, had a friend that was uh, Dr. Alea Al-Jamil, to give her credit, uh, had a friend that was doing a study in Saudi Arabia on exactly the same thing, but she was comparing silver diamine fluoride, split mouth technique, to a true sealant on the other side to see what the benefit is. Well, I don't think that's what we're looking for. But in the and I don't think on the permanent dentition that's what we're looking for because it's going to be rock hard unless maybe it's a special patient, you know, and we really can't get in there well and we're doing something um, in a preventive uh, area where we're not as concerned about aesthetics. However, I think on kids now and boy, I got to tell you during this uh, emergency care only thing, if we had some broken down teeth and there was a dude next to it that had some minor occlusal caries, so we put it right on there. And we made sure the parent knew it's gonna turn it black. And we, I guess we didn't care because we wanted to try to stop the progression of anything. So I guess what I'm looking at is, let's say you're out in the middle of the jungle somewhere and you don't have access to you know, suction, air drying and everything else, uh, or you are in your own clinic and you've got a kid jumping all over the place and you can't isolate teeth well, I think that it, that for prevention is going to be a good thing because, as I told you, anything that's demin, even a little bit, even a surface zone that's one to four percent pore volume, will uptake that silver diamine fluoride. So I think there's going to be a place for it in prevention. Okay, excellent. Appreciate that. The next question is relatively specific. Uh, this is from a dentist that practices in a prison setting where there's multiple inmates with multiple smooth surface caries lesions. Would you recommend the same silver diamine fluoride pediatric therapy sequence of application for caries when arresting lesions in adults? Well, you know, if they're asymptomatic, that's the key. Uh, you have to make sure that it's a vital tooth, but yeah, I'd recommend you do it the same way. Um, and it's not necessarily definitive treatment. And things I would love to see, and you being in a prison environment might be perfect is, you know, what about all these hot teeth that we can't get uh, anesthesia on? I wonder if putting silver diamine fluoride on something like that and doing two applications maybe over a month period, if that would calm that tooth down enough to be able to give it local anesthesia and do definitive care without them going through the ceiling. We have no, absolutely nothing in the literature that talks to us about that type of thing. But to answer the question, yeah, I would do it similar. I would apply it to the dent in the same way for a minute. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, last question we'll ask this evening um, is in regards to using silver diamine fluoride prior to a restoration with a glass enamel material. Um, whether you apply the first or second application of silver diamine fluoride, can you place glass ionomer right away, same appointment, or do you need to wait until a follow-up appointment? That's a good question, and I don't think there's an answer to it. I think you'd like to put it in um, right there the first day because it's convenient and the kid's right there. However, if you lose that restoration, remember these are under these 
interesting circumstances. And if it's glass armor, easily it could break away. Well, then they come back and you put your second coat on and put your glass iron man again. So I think that you're losing the benefit potentially of your second application. But if your restoration stays in, does it really matter? If it falls out, you can then do your second coat. And if you want to put a restoration in again, that's okay. But, you know, I, I guess where I'm at is that if I can really do a good restoration, um, I'm going to do a definitive restoration. I think I said that earlier. Excellent. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Donnelly, I just wanted to say a very, a very sincere thank you for the presentation this evening. Lots of great information for the audience. Uh, at the moment, I'd like to hand it back to Kevin for some closing remarks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Dr. Donnelly, thank you for a great presentation, and thank you all for joining. To our guests, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within an hour or two. Make sure you check your spam folder. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for links to new free CE events. The link you see on screen in the middle gives you access to our archived webinars, including our panel and our discussion today, which should be loaded up by the end of the week. Please share this link with your staff and colleagues. Finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you will find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. Education on the latest evidence in oral health prevention is what we do. We are thrilled to be back doing what we do best safely, helping you serve your patients. Thank you and have a safe and wonderful week. Bye all.